Good morning and welcome to Christchurch Where. It's lovely to be able to join with you this morning wherever you are, whether you're in your lounge or your kitchen or on your iPad or tablet or on TV. Thank you for taking the time to come and join with us as we worship together our God this morning, our God who is for us and who loves us, who knows us and is interested in us. I wonder how it's been for you this week, whether you're excited or whether actually it's just been a bit of a slog or the day has just passed by and all of a sudden Sunday's come round again. Well, the reality is, no matter how we feel, God is with us. And last week I said about that gift, that gift of grace in the midst of our weakness. And it was also in my Bible reading again this morning. So whether you're feeling strong and together, or whether you're feeling weak, or whether you've only just managed to get up to turn on the TV this morning, or to turn on the computer, God wants to give you His grace this day. And so let us choose this morning, as we set aside this time, to lean into Him. And so I invite you, wherever you are, why don't you just open your hands to Him this morning? just adopting a slightly different posture to say, here I am, Lord. I choose to meet with you. Will you meet with me? And as you do that, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are with us wherever we are. And as we're gathered with hands open, We invite you to fill us again with your Spirit. Where we're feeling weak, will you strengthen us? Where we're feeling happy, will you fill us with your joy even more? Where we're feeling anxious, may you surround us with your peace and your love and your compassion. And as we worship this morning, Lord, will you enable us to sing and to reflect and to listen and to just encounter you afresh this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's join in with our first song now this morning.
Some of you may know that here in Christchurch, just in this corner, there is a really large cross that leans forward. And it's underneath this cross where when we were gathered, we often used to have prayer ministry. And there was an opportunity for people to be able to stop and to reflect. And as I was sitting beneath the cross this morning, it was just reminding me so much of all that Jesus has done for us. You see, on the cross, Jesus died to deal with anything that's getting in the way between us and God. Both our guilt, our sin, but also our shame. That way of sometimes not wanting to look into the eyes of God or one another. And God himself wants you just to know his love and his forgiveness. God himself wants you to be restored to him this morning. And so in this moment, if you've got anything that's getting in the way between you and God, anything that you're feeling guilty about or ashamed of or wish you hadn't done or wish you'd done differently. God knows it. He loves you. Jesus died for you. And God wants you to know that you're forgiven. So in this silence for a moment, will you just bring those things before God? And then I'm going to pray a prayer of confession. Father, we're sorry for those things for which we have done and said or haven't done or haven't said. Will you forgive us because of Jesus? Will you help us to see Jesus even more clearly? And Lord Jesus, where sometimes we're then ashamed and that sticks with us, where it mars us or stops us from walking forward, Will you come by your Spirit and replace any shame with your honor and your love and your delight in us? Will you come and strengthen us to be able to walk with you again, to live with you again, to look into your eyes and know your gaze of love and your gaze of compassion? So restore us and renew us Enable us this day to live again for you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. And so, as God's forgiven people, let us continue in our worship now this morning as we connect even deeper with God. Yeah. 
And so, Father, we just thank you for your word. And as we come now to your word, as it's read and as it's proclaimed this morning, as we look at that partnership in you working in us as we continue to serve you, may you fill us afresh with your spirit. Open our eyes to see you anew and our ears to hear you anew. Enable our minds to understand and our hearts to fall deeper in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading this week is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. Shining as stars. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Father, it's... uh... This is your word. We're here this morning to open ourselves to you. So speak, Father. Your servants are listening. Amen. There were two boys. There were two boys and one of them had a dog. And they're out having a walk and, and the dog owner wanted to show off to his friend. So, uh, so he said, oh, I've, I've, I've taught my dog how to whistle. And his friend looked at him, looked at the dog I've never heard your dog whistle. No, silly, said the dog owner. I said I taught him how to whistle. He didn't learn how to whistle. Now, Winston Churchill has famously said that uh, he, he, he's always ready to learn. Always ready to learn. Although I do not always like being taught. In approaching this morning's reading, we do well to remember the difference between, between teaching and learning. This is a partnership required here, which is a theme today, partnering with God. In today's verses, Paul is doing what Paul so often does when he writes to the early church. Uh, in all his writings, he mixes deep teaching of doctrine, of faith, not works, but then goes on to say something like, so get on with it then. And he doesn't mind repeating himself either. In, in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 6, we've already seen him say, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He says in verse 27 of the first chapter, conduct yourself in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And now, in our reading, work out your salvation. Live according to God's good purposes. And by the way, that uh, the Greek word you, uh, translated as work out there is, is the same sense of what's there in chap- chapter 1, verse 6. It's, we'll carry it to completion. It's bring it to its logical end. Work it out. Live it out. In short, get on with it. Get on with it. Paul is a good teacher. He wants the church to know the who, the what, the where, the when, the how, and the why of God's kingdom. The why is the, is the, is the great so what question. And Paul's answer is, well, so you can get on with it. So you can have life in the full, a life of meaning. Therefore, therefore, Paul 
says in verse 12, get on with it. Before we take a deeper look at that, let's just remind ourselves of what this therefore refers to. It's the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how, all contained in the ancient church hymn, which is recorded in those six previous verses. Um, The who is Christ, the humility of God to to make himself in human likeness, which is verse 6 and 7. The what, well, what did Jesus do? Well, he came in the image of man to, to pay for man's sin by dying on the cross. That's verse 8. The where, where did this happen? Well, it happened in Jerusalem, in the land God gave to Israel. God's kingdom was finally being established. When, when did it happen? Well, it, it's established in eternity, in the highest place, not just in one moment of time. That's verse 9. Well, how? How did it happen? How does God's kingdom get established in our time, today, our place? That's verses 10 and 11. It's when we bow down before Jesus and confess he is Lord. When we have faith in Jesus, accepting who he is and confessing our sins before him. It's It's a great song, isn't it? That song. No wonder Paul invokes it. Faith, not works. A gift of grace. We didn't deserve it. A gift from God who made us simply to be accepted. In our reading, Paul says, Therefore, given all that, therefore, now we get to the, to the why. The so what. And the answer to the so what question is that is so that we can live well. I'll come to the fear and trembling in a moment, but what God, what does living well mean in this context? Well, verse 13 tells us. It means living out the work God has done in our lives. He works salvation in us, and we work it out in the world. There you are, the so what test. God teaches, we learn. Any teacher will tell you, I know we have a lot of teachers associated with Christ Church where, any teacher will tell you that a a pupil cannot learn without internalizing and externalizing the teaching. They must live it, speak it out, adopt it as right and good. Paul says as much in verse 13, it's good to work out what God has planted within us because God's purposes planted within us are good purposes. Remember Winston Churchill, he loved to learn, just not being told what to do or think. Maybe for all his positive characteristics, Humility wasn't one of them. But this is what Paul is driving at in this section of his letter. He is reminding the church of the humility of Jesus and that this is what God wants man to reflect. The fear of God in our inner being and the trembling of our outer body are just metaphors for the appropriate humility before an all-powerful creator God who humbled himself before we have a chance to humble ourselves. Paul is saying that the the partnership God desires, the the response we need to make is to reflect Christ's likeness, particularly his humility. Verse 16 talks of the word of life. The word of life is a word that reflects the nature of God. Love, grace, purpose, forgiveness. What a contrast then to the word of complaining. 
an argumentative word. Verse 14. These are, these are worldly characteristics. The crooked and depraved generation of verse 15. Paul listed many of these kind of crooked characteristics, didn't he? Galatians chapter 5, amongst many others, he says that the acts of the flesh are obvious. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Any of those familiar with anybody? Paul goes on, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. You won't get marked down by anybody by conducting yourself in such ways. Paul is saying that unless you live out the nature of Christ, unless you work out the salvation that God worked in you, then you won't shine like stars in the universe. And that's, chap that's verse 15. And that, I believe, is the, the so what test for us this morning. How do you score on these? Have you learnt the lessons God has planted within you? Or do you complain too much? Do you argue too much? If you do, how are you going to distinguish yourself from the world, which verse 5 described as a crooked and depraved generation? You know, as children, at least in Australia, I'm not sure about here, I should have checked, we sing, uh, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Of course, that's patent, childish nonsense, isn't it? As adults, we, we know too well the damage inflicted by wrong words. And I believe we should all take this opportunity to challenge ourselves on this. Perhaps the Spirit is already at work within you now, bringing to mind the sort of conversations that you need to change? Do your words make people feel clean or dirty or useless? Remember Jesus' metaphor of the vine and the branches in John chapter 15, verse 3. He says that we are made clean. We are saved. We are set apart. We are redeemed. Made clean by the word he has spoken. That's the benchmark, people. <laughs> That's the standard. Are your words peacemaking or trouble-stirring? I, I once read an, an interview with Tim Martin, the owner of uh, Weatherspoons, yes, the pub chain. Uh, he said something that really spoke to me and, and challenged me. He said, once you start arguing... You tend to marginalize yourself. And, and once you marginalize yourself, you, you tend to, to radicalize yourself. Marginalization and radicalization are not strategies for unity, are they? And certainly not strategies to represent the values of Christ. And however powerful the, the publican's words were, I, I realized I had heard them before. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 16 to 18. It reads like this Do not be over righteous, neither be over wise. Why, why destroy yourself? It says. Do not be over wicked, do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God, and this is the important bit, whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Now that teaching might sound strange if it's the first time you've come across it. Don't be too righteous. What? 
if that doesn't sound right to you, look it up later. Ecclesiastes 7, 16 to 18. And take a, a deep reflection on it. It's saying the same thing as Tim Martin, the wise man of Witherspoon. Extremists are divisive. One of the reasons extremists are not welcome in God's kingdom is because to take an extreme view is to set yourself up as an expert and know it all. Nothing else to learn. But God says, His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Only God is an expert. Fearing God means to accept that we are not God. We do not know it all. And once we have that humility, we begin to understand the character of Jesus. And we then begin to work out that character in our lives. Our character is, is saved and redeemed by the work of God in us. And we begin to reflect that in the choices we make, the way that we live our life. And very importantly for today, the way that we speak to others. Not arguing or complaining. Do you desire to live more that way, to reflect the humility of Jesus in the, in the way that you speak to others? I know that I do. I've been paid to argue my whole 32-year career. It's part of who I am. But another part of me rejoices in the fact that I can never know it all. I rejoice in not having to be an extremist for God. He releases me from that pressure. It's a, it's a great relief to know that life and truth do not revolve around me. It's a partnership with God. And I know I'm not the senior partner. It's an ongoing work. It's the ongoing work or one ongoing work of my life to practice that humility in my workplace. Paul himself, at the end of our passage, gives a vivid indication that he also took this view. Verse 16 reads, And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain, but, but even if I am being poured out like a, a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Paul's boast here is not in himself, is it? But in the lives and sacrificial witness of the Philippians. He refers to the drink offering being poured on the sacrifice. In, in temple sacrifice, the meal and the drink offerings were not primary offerings. The primary offering was the sacrificial lamb. Paul is using this image, obviously understood by the, the church in Philippi, who must have been Jews. Uh, he, he uses this image to say, hey, your sacrifice is more significant than mine. Paul is practicing humility and encouragement. Definitely two characteristics of Christ. The challenge today is this. Let's go and do likewise in the way that we treat others. I don't think the boy in the story really taught his dog how to whistle. don't think so. But God really did send Jesus to teach us how to live. The challenge of today's scripture is, have you really learned the lesson Jesus has taught your soul? Does your life, and in particular the way that you treat others, show you are taught of God? Let's give Jesus the last word, shall we? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my partners, that you love one another. Let's pray. Just take a moment to yourself.
the song we'll soon be singing in response to what God's been telling us this morning speaks of partnership, speaks of learning, speaks of being taught by God. For I am yours and you are mine. My soul will rest in you, in your embrace. That's the partnership. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger. That's the learning. Calling upon God's name, keeping my eyes above the waves, looking to God in all things, seeing him above the present circumstances of your life. That's the teaching. Have you been challenged about the way you speak to others or the way that you speak about others? Would you like to reflect more the Christ-like character of humility, being a peacemaker? As you sing, make it a prayer that God would fulfill his good purposes and that you would be a partner in fulfilling those purposes in your life. Let's worship.
I will call upon your name. In that song, it reminds us that as we rest in God, as we know his peace surrounding us, we can call upon his name. We can call upon him in prayer, bringing before him the things that matter to us and the things that we just want to share and the things that we want to see God move in in our lives and in the world. And so I invite you to choose to lean in again as we join in with our intercessions this morning, as we call upon God's name to move in our world. Heavenly Father, as we come together for prayer, please draw alongside us as we enter into your presence. May we be still and in awe of your majesty. Lord, first of all, we lift up this week to you, however our weeks have been and however they have turned out. We give you thanks and glory for times we can recall where we have seen your hand at work and felt your presence with us. We are grateful for all you bless us with, Lord. We may also recall situations over the last week where we have doubted your presence or your promise of forgiveness. Lord, be in all our disappointments, our frustrations, our sadness, our loneliness and our fear. Thank you, Lord, that you are willing to always journey alongside us, no matter what. And may we remember that your grace is sufficient and your love and compassion knows no bounds. Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours as we bring to mind all that is going on in the world at large and we pray for your divine intervention. Maybe let's take a moment now to bring whatever is on our hearts, whatever that might be, and we pray for your will to be done, Lord. So let's take this time to lift up the Ouija people of China. We also want to pray for, please Lord, for an end to COVID. And a pr we pray also for a fair and just distribution of much needed vaccinations around the world. Thank you for scientific endeavor that has made these vaccines possible. And thank you for key workers working long hours to roll out the vaccination program here and also at the same time looking after those who are very ill as well. We pray for those clo for things closer to home and we give you thanks and praise for John, for Heather and the girls and for all the leadership and workers at Christ Church. Please bless all that they do. Thank you also for the communities that we live in Bless our neighbours and those we meet on our way each day. We thank you also for the courses that are being run out at the moment at Christ Church, the Alpha Course and the Bereavement Journey course. Thanks, Lord, and we pray that you'll bless all those who are helping and especially be with all those who are attending each week. Please go ahead of our plans coming up. Lord, such as the great church big night in, and also prepare our hearts and minds for fasting and praying during this coming week. Lord, may we offer our all to you, and please help us with our week ahead. Be with us, and may we see your hand at work. Open our eyes to see more of Jesus in our every day. Lord, we offer these prayers to you now and we give you thanks and praise, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. 
now and forever. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. His cornerstone is solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love. By the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Him in the death of Christ I live There in the ground the light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost his grip on me lovely that you've been able to join with us here this morning as we've worshipped together. I've got a couple of notices for us. The first is that this Wednesday is our day of prayer and fasting, so we'd love it if you set aside some time just to be spending with the Lord, praying both for the world situation for our country, for your friends and neighbours, for the activities of the church, for those that are coming to faith and those that are in need at this time. And do feel free to sign up to spend an hour of that day so that throughout that day we have a chain of prayer going on. But the second thing also to be able to share with you is some of this time we're often spending time at home. But there's other things we can do together. And so at the end of half term, we're planning for a big fun night in. You'll see all the details on your screen now. It's an opportunity for us as church family just to gather together, to be able to have some fun together, to have some games, to be able to chat and catch up with one another. So if you'd like to be able to join in with that, you just need to email Jess, our children's worker, And it's open for anybody aged 7 all the way up to 100. So please do sign up and join in for the Christchurch's big night of fun. But as we come now to go on into our weeks, let us pray God's blessing upon us. And so may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace that as you trust in him, you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you 
remain with you and flow from you. Fill your home and your workplace. Fill where you spend your day. And may you know God's peace with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we invite you, if you wish to, just to remain worshipping and resting with the Lord and connecting with Him this morning. It might be that you wanted to just pray with one of your friends. Just pick up the phone and be able to pray together or via Zoom or WhatsApp. Use these moments, as we would if we were gathered, just to carry on connecting with the Lord.
to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your